Gotcha! <laughs> Going hunting. That's how one Minneapolis police officer described shooting protesters with rubber bullets following the murder of George Floyd. We have new body cam footage that shows some troubling actions by officers. We'll break it down for you. Plus, how did it come to this? Stalking lawmakers into bathrooms and onto street corners in search of a gotcha moment. When did the American political landscape turn into sport? Some cases feels more like WrestleMania. Politicians pontificating. It's a lot of words and little action as our country tries to stay united. But is all of this division, is it something we can recover from? We'll get into that as well. And how do we turn things around? That and much more as we start our broadcast tonight from our studios live in Chicago. The Donlin Report starts right now. Great to have you with us. When did the American political landscape turn into sport? In most cases, it feels almost like an event, as we mentioned earlier, from WrestleMania. But from the NFL or Major League Baseball, politics has become more of the national sport for us. And the question is, since when? Will it ever change? Here's an example of what we're talking about. A judge blocks the Texas abortion law, and there are cheers. Everyone from the Attorney General Merrick Garland and the White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki to pop star Billie Eilish. When did court cases become something we cheer or jeer, celebrate on social media? What's next? Trading cards featuring our favorite district court judges? Here's another example. The Senate reaches a temporary deal on the debt ceiling, something that essentially has to be done. Republicans said Democrats had to do it on their own. And then when the deal was done, Democrats said Mitch McConnell caved. Again, we're talking about winners and losers. And by the way, this deal only lasts until December 3rd, so we'll probably be keeping score on this again for sure. Let's not forget political gotcha moments as well. We've seen a lot of them, from lawmakers being chased into bathrooms to being followed on streets. This is some of what we've seen here with Rashida Tlaib commenting at one point that she was wearing a mask because of a Republican tracker near her, perhaps being sarcastic for sure, but it was a headline today, the video talking about what she had said on someone's camera who was following her. Certainly reminds us, reminds us of some videos we've been showing again all week. Progressive activists chasing Senator Kirsten Sinema into a bathroom, others confronting her as well in an airport, on an airplane, because she's holding up, in their minds, a win for the president. Again, a win, we're keeping score here. Politics, as we mentioned, has become sport. The president, on that note, desperately needs a win, as long as we're trying to keep track of a scorecard because of his sagging approval numbers. 38%, according to the latest Quinnipiac poll, that's a new low. The president himself says, if you don't support his spending bill, you're holding the country back. To oppose these investments is to be complicit in America's decline. Other countries are speeding up and America's falling behind. It is a vicious cycle. Question is, is it fueled by media and social media and politicians on both sides? That's where we begin tonight with two friends of the program as we get settled in here, Rochelle Ritchie and Pat Brady. So Rochelle, let's start with you. Make sense of this for me because I think this might be why a lot of people watch and say this is why nothing gets done. It either has to be a win or a loss and take no prisoners. Yeah, I think people are very frustrated by everything that they're seeing as far as like the, the infighting that is happening. But I think we also have to understand that historically, this has sort of been the temperature for the country when it comes to some of these very high item agendas. You have to think to yourself, like everything has been sort of a political agenda where you have, you know, the yeas and nays on one side. You go back all the way to uh, the Brown versus the Board of Education. You go back to the 19th Amendment. All of these things have been a par historically a part of this kind of political sport, if you will. Yeah, Pat, you were a former prosecutor. Are you surprised that you're seeing the cheering and jeering on some of these court decisions? No, and I think you just mentioned it, although I was around for some of those decisions. I know Rochelle <laughs> wasn't, but yeah, that's always, the Supreme Court has always been a part of the political fabric, going back to Dred Scott back in the uh, 1800s and through the 50s and 60s. I think you're right, though, it's more pronounced now because there's more social media and people take sides. But the Supreme Court has always been, I mean, they're interpreting what the Constitution's supposed to do. Right. And it's always been front and center in politics. Is this something you think, Rochelle, the 
majority of people are interested in the minutia of this, the sausage making, or, I mean, we had George Will on the other night, and he said, you know, most people are just worried about getting the screen door fixed, make a cheese sandwich, it's going to be okay. <laughs> I mean, they are, but it is entertaining. You know what I mean? At the end of the day, you know, as they say on news, if it bleeds, it leads. You know, we're all sort of... Uh, you gravitate to the drama of mm -hmm. politics in a sense. But I also do that. I think at some point, and I think now, uh, the American voter and the American people are really tired of some of the, the political um, infighting and the fighting with each other. And I think that it's because you're starting to see politicians fight for party and not for people, hmm. and that's really problematic. Well, I do wonder about what people really do think of it, Rochelle. We have some numbers here that show or indicate at least that America is kind of tired of this. Both parties are underwater in their favorability ratings. Pat, uh, we'll show these here in just a second and get them to you, but in the meantime, uh, we haven't really covered the debt ceiling issue much because we knew it would get done. We knew it had to get done. And when it done, there was done, there were more victory laps. Um, and then we get to this situation with the infrastructure bill, and it's a bipartisan bill we all celebrate. And now we have what we are where we are now, which is more bickering. Yeah, well, that's because that's there's two separate bills, and there's a lot of support nationally for, for the infrastructure bill. But where there isn't support is, and this is the far-left agenda getting in the way of the president's agenda, who ran as a more moderate Democrat, the, the, the liberal part wing of the party is holding this whole hostage, the, the infrastructure bill. I mean, they, they linked the two votes. That's a really bad development for, for the Democrats. And to your point on, on what you're talking, that people get so upset and scream and yell about it, that's part of politics. And this is a political guy that does campaigns. Mm -hmm. Negative campaigning, it works. It fires up your base, and you have to get your people out to vote, and that's one way you do it. I don't like it, but that's the reality of politics. And that's why it happens so much, because it is effective. It is. It's a fact. I mean, you have to find when you're out here fighting for these different issues, you have to find that nugget, that thing that makes people mm -hmm. emotional, whether it's making them happy, making them angry. And for most politicians, they, they tend to lead towards the anger uh, part of it because people love to be mad about something. Um, and I think what you're seeing happening now as far as like the infighting, uh, the I, I don't like it. I, I mean, I saw the tweet by AOC and Tlaib and others and I'm at, at, towards uh, Senator Cinema, and I'm just thinking to myself, this is not what we need. We don't need the house of social media. We need, you know, <laughs> people to go into their chambers or into their office and work these issues out together instead of going on social media and tweeting about it. Well, I don't know that that place exists when it comes to abortion, as you guys both know. It's, just, it's one side or the other where folks are on this. And we just had a big decision on the Texas abortion ruling and another big case coming up before the Supreme Court. Pat, what should we look for? Boy, that is full of political landmines for both sides. This case is going to basically take Roe versus Wade and, and put a viability standard in the Roe versus Wade decision. If you read that decision, there's a lot of wiggle room on, on that, the fundamental right to privacy court found 50 years ago. But I think for the Republicans, it's probably a bigger risk because there's, the Democrats right now are kind of, there's no energy there because Trump's gone. And they're fighting with each other over how much they want to spend or where the party wants to go. But if this abortion debate our choice debate heats up in the next election cycle after this Supreme Court decision, I think that's going to fire up a lot of the activist Democrats to get out and, and, and try to, to change it or change the legislation or vote people out that weren't supportive of it. We will see, I guess, from the Supreme Court in June. By June, I think we'll have a decision on that, Rochelle. But what do you think about the political fallout, regardless of how that turns out? You know, honestly, I feel like what Governor Abbott has done is a little bit of political posturing. I mean, just when you look at some of the things that are in this law, I mean, did he really think he was going to be able to keep the courts and the clerks and everyone out of uh, any sort sort of decision making that is happening when it comes to if someone, for instance, is sued the $10,000 because they an Uber driver took them to the right. abortion clinic and now some guy saw it and now is suing the Uber driver for $10,000. I mean, do you really think that that's going to like fly? And of course you don't think it's going to fly because, and that's why he put in the bill to get the courts out of it. So I think there's a lot of things in here that are just political posturing that are just doing exactly what Pat, Pat sort of uh, talked about, which is energizing a certain kind of base. And he's doing it in a way where he knows that it's not going to fly, but it still gets people angry enough to go out and vote. Let's get you both on this social media situation, perhaps amplifying what we're talking about here. You've seen these videos now from chasing people into bathrooms and in restaurants, in airports, everywhere else. Is this where we are now? Yeah, it's a weird world. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't grow up with social media. I grew up with three newspapers and three television stations. But social media now, everything's on. Everything is on it. And I do think there's some pushback. And you saw last week with Facebook and some of the other... Even my kids are like, you know, enough's enough. We're closing these accounts down. But, you know, we 
We put trackers on candidates mm. when we're running campaigns all the time. So you just have to expect if you're in the political realm or a public figure that somebody's going to follow you into the bathroom. But these aren't trackers, though, I wouldn't think, Rochelle. These are folks who uh, have, I guess, their agenda they want pushed forward. And I think the other thing about this that stands out is it's pretty incessant. It's happening in a lot of different places. And it appears that they're really, if nothing else, going for that gotcha moment. They want someone to blow up or they want someone to get angry or a moment that they can turn viral. They want to go viral. Right. I mean, that that is the entire goal of all of this is to go viral. And, you know, when I look at these videos, I think to myself, you know, I was a reporter at one point mm -hmm. and there was a way that you approach people, even if it was something controversial or you were going to ask them, you know, some pretty tough questions. And, and they were, you know, not expecting to see you. But the way that they're doing it to me is very hostile and volatile. And it's just going to take one person doing one thing and someone is going to get hurt. I mean, when we think about what happened, I worked on uh, Capitol Hill uh, when um, the, the shooting happened at the baseball field. Right. And I'm thinking to myself, that is what this type of stuff leads mm -hmm. to. Right now, you just have people with their cell phones running around. But then the next thing you know, you have someone at a gun at a political event. And that is extremely dangerous. And I don't think this is a way um, to necessarily get things done. I think this only turns people off from whatever that agenda is that someone is seeking. All right, Rochelle Ritchie, Pat Brady, great to have you both tonight. Thanks for joining us. For Thanks. The Pulse of America tonight. We're going to get a bit more now on politics. Another topic, the response to President Biden's studio-like set that he's been using to speak to America. The set's essentially a fake White House featuring digital monitors with a rose garden in full bloom. Should be noticed uh, that this is located just across the street from the actual White House. And again, here, one of these issues that you wonder why uh, folks are talking about, but a lot are on social media. So we thought we would bring in our friend Julia Manchester from The Hill and ask her why they would do this, Julia, when they have the actual White House right across the street. You know, it's a good question, Joe. I think they probably do this for optics to get a clear picture, to get a picture where you can see outside of the windows to make it more, I guess, visually, aesthetically appealing. So clearly that's a part of their setup strategy. But we have seen President Biden um, in the Oval Office doing events in various rooms of the White House. So this seems to be um, just a new digital strategy. And I would like to note that he was also Zooming and with a number of business leaders. So I'm wondering wondering if maybe it was a part of um, the setup of that Zoom. So is it's not like he's trying to hide this from reporters because the reporters are actually in the room there watching all of this. Yeah, they're watching all of this in the room and it's live streamed. So even if you're not technically a White House reporter, you don't have those credentials, you can still go in and essentially watch this. So it's still, uh, you know, there's a, a, enough access being given, you know, at this point at, for this actual event. Some are wondering if it might be COVID related, as you said, uh, you know, perhaps it's just maybe uh, this century's version of how presidents do business, I guess at least, but it is across the street. Other say it's for teleprompter reasons. Yeah, it could be for teleprompter reasons. I mean, I know that a lot of conservatives and Biden's critics like to uh, poke fun at him for sometimes using a teleprompter. I think that's something that a lot of other uh, past presidents, including President Trump, have had to deal with. I mean, you heard uh, during President Trump's presidency, there was Trump and teleprompter Trump when he was reading from mm -hmm. the teleprompter. So it seems like it's a certain line of attack, but it could be for a number of reasons. It could be for COVID. It could be for optics. Um, in terms of getting that clear digital shot. It could be for logistics with Zooming and wanting to get mm -hmm. all of those business leaders on the screen with the president. Right. I mean, it is one of those things people, I mean, they talked about, remember when President Trump brought out the little tiny desk <laughs> at one point, everyone seems to talk about these little things when it comes to furnishings and, and other uh, side items. But Julia Manchester, it's good to see you. And um, I think we can all attest to the value of the teleprompter. It definitely helps. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you, Joe. All right, Julia, take care. Going hunting. That's how one Minneapolis police officer described shooting protesters with rubber bullets and then celebrating the city's police under the spotlight tonight. We'll break that down for you. And as the search for Brian Laundry continues, his father now joins the search. How big of a development is that? Are they any closer to finding him? And speaking of fugitives, the feds have been trying to track down this guy for 23 years. And check this out. Could this be him at a Dodgers game? Not last night's game, but from 2016. We'll bring in the experts and give you the latest on that.
Don't forget, you can follow us on social media at The Donlin Report on Twitter. To serve and protect, or us versus them, newly released body cam footage from Minneapolis police from the time of the George Floyd riots makes it look a lot more like the latter. Make sure you follow closely. We have put subtitles on to help you. <laughs> so if it looks like they're hunting protesters, perhaps it's because they are. In another clip, a uh, now retired police commander describes their strategy in those very terms. Tonight it was just nice to hear, we're going to go find some more people. Instead of chasing people around, yeah. we're going to hunt. You guys are out hunting people now, and it's just a nice change of tempo. Yep, agreed. These people. So no doubt the tensions in Minneapolis since Floyd's death have been high, with protesters confronting police in a series of sometimes violent protests, police trying to maintain order, but police calling their tactics a hunt. Steve Rogers, retired New Jersey police lieutenant, as well as naval intelligence officer, Steve, it's good to have you back with us. What we're seeing here in this body camera footage, is this, do you think, a cause or an effect of what happened after George Floyd's death? Well, I've got to tell you, it's uh, troubling. It's disturbing. Look, I understand the frustration, the aggravation, and the tension and pressure the police are under. But in order to address issues like what they saw in Minneapolis, you need a uh, command, you need control, you need to keep your cool. And I've got to tell you, I have talked to police officers from throughout this country via phone call who saw the video. It's very, very troubling. Uh, look, we're supposed to not hunt people down. We're supposed to protect people and arrest people who are breaking the law. That is our job. It's supposed to be done in an orderly, strategic, and tactical manner. So this was not done. And uh, it, it certainly hurt the image of the police nationwide, let alone in that area. Yeah, let's play another. We have a couple more clips for you, Steve. Let's start with this one where uh, protesters are saying that uh, police are watching nearby. This one's quick, um, so listen carefully. This group probably is predominantly white. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Because oh, he's not looting and fighting. So, Steve, this whole case really was about race and, and the use of force. And this history has, uh, city has a lot of history. They're actually talking about making significant reforms in that city as a result. Is there any context we're missing here? No, not at all. I, I, again, it's troubling. You know, we, we're trying to, we, I mean, the good cops around the country are trying to share with the public that not every cop is racist, that we're doing the best we could to build police community relations. But when you hear things like this, it reinforces the individuals who believe that there's a racism in police ranks across the country. Look, I love to use the NYPD as a model police department when it comes to addressing civil disturbances. They're orderly, they're equipped, they know how to use their equipment. They know when to use it. Uh, there is no brutality. Uh, it, look, you're going to have pockets of guys getting out of control. But for the most part, NYPD is a very professionally run organization. Uh, and uh, I didn't see professionalism here. I saw everything that the good cops are saying we're not. Uh, so it's going to have to begin with a lot of soul searching in the hearts of those cops that took the that said these words, as well as training. It's all about training. It's about accountability of supervisors all the way up to the police chief. Right. I think we've all heard the line uh, about how there are certain professions where you can't afford to have any bad apples, and that probably comes to mind when you hear the argument and debate in some of these. Let's play another for you, Steve. This is a clip that got a lot of play because it goes to how these protests often escalate, as we talked a minute ago. The tensions are certainly high. Let's listen. We'll just want to wait until we got resources. I mean, I, I got no problem with that. I love to scatter them, but I think it's time to f put yeah. 100 people in jail. Yeah. So, Steve, this, I think, it stands out for a couple of reasons, too. These body cameras are rolling. It almost brings the question up of whether the officers are aware of it or when you're in the heat of your job there and trying to, you know, take care of what's happening and unfolding, are you not really paying attention to that? 
Well, let me say this to you. Uh, I've been in situations where the heat was coming down, like you say, the heat of the job. But when you have proper supervision and proper training, uh, you're going to be focused on doing your job within the framework of the law. Yeah, things are going to be said uh, like the locker room talk, as you say. This isn't locker room talk. This, this is really troubling. Uh, hunting people down. We're going to uh, uh, shoot people. We're going to do things that are not within the realm of being a professional law enforcement officer. There are police officers who do lose control and they need to be uh, dealt with. But I, I just want to emphasize that what we hear these people say and what we see is not across the board. We got great cops across this country. We're just as trouble as anyone else. See, this is going to perhaps come out at an interesting time because next month, voters in Minneapolis are going to go to the polls and decide whether to fundamentally change the police department and basically break it down and start from scratch. Do you think you might see some of this footage in the campaigns to try to pass that? I'm sure we will, but uh, I would ask the people of Minneapolis and around the country to think about all of the crimes that police officers have stopped, uh, police officers around the country that have been killed in the line of duty. There are a lot more good cops than there are bad cops. So I would hope on balance people would take a real good look at that and don't defund your police, defend the police, but defend the good cops. We don't need any bad apples, as you say, in our police departments, but defend the good cops and give them the opportunity to interact with the people. And let's get back to community policing, because that's where the solution begins. Retired Police Lieutenant Stephen Rogers, it's great to have you with us tonight. Thanks for your insight. Some positive news on the COVID front tonight. Overall cases and deaths continue to decline across the country, which coincides with a rise in vaccinations. Tonight, though, we're looking into the issue of natural immunity. Here's what former COVID testing czar with the Trump administration, Dr. Brett Giroir, told us about that last night. There are no data that prove that vaccine immunity is superior to natural immunity. That just doesn't exist, and in fact, there are much uh, data to the contrary. That being said, even if you have natural immunity, if you get a vaccine, you can be even super protected. So for people who are not undergoing a transplant, I think the data are clear. Natural immunity is powerful and should be an option to vaccines for those who don't want to get the vaccine for any reason. Let's bring in now immunologist and public health advocate, Dr. Human Nuchar, uh, Nurchasm. Doctor, you and I talked about this, I don't know, maybe it was a month or so ago. I do. I'm, I'm sure that um, is sort of uh, nice to see your thoughts uh, echoed by the doctor there. Yeah. Why are we not hearing more about this on the national stage? Well, I think it's it's absolutely disappointing that that the Biden administration is not embracing this issue. There are literally millions of Americans who are COVID recovered. They're serologically immune, and uh, the preponderance of evidence, really, and very solid evidence, is demonstrating that these folks are equally, if not better, protected from subsequent infection compared to people who are, you know, uh, fully vaccinated and COVID naive. So I think it's a dramatic mistake. In fact, today, the president of the United States in his speech in Illinois, uh, again, reiterated this idea that this is a pandemic of the unvaccinated. I would qualify that by saying that, in fact, this is a pandemic of the unimmune, Mr. President. And I think that this is a critical, critical difference. As you know, you know, there are, in fact, people who are fully vaccinated who are ending up infected. These are folks who are actually unimmune despite the fact that they're fully vaccinated and that's the simplest most likely explanation we already know that anywhere from 10 to 30 percent of people who are vaccinated either with johnson and johnson or the mrna uh, vaccine are actually not effectively immunized that those are the numbers that the companies themselves advertise so this idea that this is a pandemic of the unvaccinated that is actually dangerous because in the same setting the united states uh, food and drug administration has actually blocked the pathway to getting antibody tested there's an advisory on may 19th 2021 where where the FDA discourages Americans from getting their immunity checked. This is huh. a mistake. Well, that yeah, that's the whole idea. If you get the antibody test, then you know. But I have a question for you on that, doctor. If that's the case, why is it that every state and every statistic I see shows that 90% plus of the people either sick, hospitalized, or dying are unvaccinated? 
Well, I think that that's uh, that's absolutely right. Uh, the, the, there's a, there, there are a lot of folks who are not vaccinated and are not immune. But they're also, on the flip side of it, as I said, with the millions of Americans who've actually been vaccinated uh, with a vaccine that has an efficacy rate anywhere from 10 to 30 percent, there are going to be a lot of folks who are actually uh, va fully vaccinated and not immune. So I think what we can do here is we can walk and chew gum at the same time. Really, the focus should be immunity. And the solution is not to block Americans from knowing the status of their personal immunity. The solution is to actually encourage people to check their immunity. In my own practice, whenever I've shown people that they have no antibody immunity, I've been able to convince some vaccine um, hesitants, some people who are on the fence about vaccination to get, get vaccinated. I would say 50% of people who, who see that they're not immune, go ahead and go get vaccinated. And this is, this is in my experience. On the flip side of it, I've also seen, Joe, people who are fully vaccinated with very low levels of antibodies or no antibodies. And, hmm. and these people are the people who are very confident about being fully immune uh, from their vaccine, but, but in fact are not. So I think we really should take a more nuanced approach. Unfortunately, the President of the United States is not taking a very nuanced approach. I, I think he's getting some very bad advice from his advisors regarding immunity. I think our focus should be immunity, not vaccination per se. Let's play another clip from Dr. Jawa last night about the Delta variant after former FDA chief Dr. Scott Gottlieb said it would likely be the last wave. Here's the clip. I do believe we have had a turning point. Delta was so contagious that it swept through the susceptible population, all those who had not gotten a vaccine and all those who had never had COVID before. Uh, remember, we were having, even though they reported 100,000 cases a day, it was more like a half a million cases a day. So I do believe the virus is burning out all the susceptible individuals. So what do you make of this, doctor? Do you think we've made a, a turning point here? Look, I, I, I don't know. I, I think, I think uh, that's pure speculation. What, what, what is a safe bet is that somewhere around 30 percent of the American population is still unimmune. And I think as our furnaces go on this fall and winter, as, as people go indoors, I think we can expect that we're, we're, we're going to see flares, especially in parts of the country where immunity rates are low. And these are both going to be folks who are, who are vaccinated and unvaccinated and unimmune. Uh, you, you remember the example up in Barnstable, Massachusetts, where, you know, uh, the large population of folks ended up uh, uh, vaccinated right, but that. ended up in the hospital with infections you know this is this is actually the, the problem the problem is that we need to be focused on immunity instead the Biden administration's focused on a one-size-fit-all vaccination and ignores frankly uh, about 100 million Americans who are already immune and, and all the data is showing that these folks are equally if not better protected from reinfection it's really tearing this country apart and I and I think it's a it's a serious mistake on the part of the administration you, you I mentioned that correct it. the president is in Chicago today and he's talking about the effectiveness of, of the the vaccine and also of mandates, which I think are borne out in the numbers. 95 million eligible Americans were unvaccinated when the president announced his mandate last month, and now it's down to 67 million. So it's, it's effective, to your point. Do you think that's why we're seeing a decrease in the number of cases and also in the number of deaths, even though we're still losing 1,800 people a day? Look, I think as we as time goes on, uh, folks are going to get immune either through natural immunity or through vaccination. There's no question about that. I think I think the pandemic is going to burn itself out, hopefully uh, before the summer of 23. But um, you know, I, I think that the president is actually um, using these rigid mandates is really creating a, a, a crisis for himself poli politically, frankly, downstream as well as a public health crisis because people are feeling coerced. You know, I, I think there's a, there's a large number of folks who are vaccine you know, hesitant or are on the fence about the vaccine who are COVID recovered. And, you know, everything we know about immunology and common sense tells us that, look, if I, if I just had a whopping case of COVID, why should I go get this vaccine that has a certain incidence of complications? Now, the incidence of complications is low, but if you're COVID recovered and you're, and you're protected, you, you subjecting yourself to that risk is actually a risk of harm. And I think the president doesn't really understand this. Mm. I, I really genuinely believe that he's getting some bad advice uh, from his advisors. And I, and I sincerely hope that uh, everyone in the Biden administration could actually level with, uh, with the American people and amongst themselves and really take an honest look at the natural immunity data set. It, it really is tearing this country apart. And really, the, I, I can't tell you the number of emails I get every day from federal employee, from private employee mm -hmm. who are COVID recovered and they demonstrate natural immunity, but they're being forced you know, at, the, at the risk of coercion, losing their, losing their empl employment opportunities, educational opportunities. It's really horrific to see this country being, getting torn apart like this by the executive branch. <laughs> Immunologist and public health advocate, Dr. Huma Norchasm. Doctor, thanks again for your time joining us. Thanks for having me, Joe.
Well, here's a headline that caught our eye this morning, and it's not getting a lot of attention. A contingent of U.S. Special Operations and Marine Forces have been secretly training Taiwanese troops for more than a year as concern over China's aggression grows. Officials telling the Wall Street Journal over the last year, roughly two dozen members of U.S. Special Operation Units and supporting troops have conducted ground training while the Marines have worked to train small boat units. Here to talk more about this, former Naval Intelligence Officer John Jordan and columnist and author of the book, The Coming Collapse of China, that's Gordon Chang. Uh, John, let's start with you. It's, it's a small but symbolic presence, I guess. What do you make of this? Are we preparing for military action? Well, certainly we're aiding our Taiwanese allies, but I think more than that, this is a political marker, and that's why this came to light. Be interested in Gordon's take on this, but this was revealed for a reason, and that is to communicate to Beijing that, hey, the U.S. commitment is real to Taiwan, regardless of what happened in Afghanistan, even though Beijing, since Afghanistan, has been te tempted to test Taiwanese and especially U.S. resolve in light of uh, the weakness displayed a few thousand miles to the, to the west. But the idea that U.S. troops are there, it sends a message to Beijing, and it's basically laying down a marker. Gordon, is this, is this a marker, Gordon? It certainly is, Joe. And it's an important marker. Um, I wish it were a bigger marker, because I, we can actually stop the whole idea of an invasion if the Chinese realize that the U.S. will fight. If we make a clear declaration that we will defend Taiwan, China won't try it. So obviously having Americans in Taiwan does help, but we need more. We need a brigade, for instance. We need American planes on Taiwan yeah. runways. We need American ships home ported in Kaohsiung. We do these things, we prevent a war. Haven't we done that, John? I mean, doesn't Taiwan know yeah, we have their back? Well, we haven't really home ported them there. Right, no, I mean, you know, but we, they, we, they know we have their back. We've ships visit, but we've not home ported. Yeah, I think we need to have more freedom of navigation exercises. We need a more robust ground presence there, perhaps with uh, including the Aegis Ashore System, which is a surface, to, which is an air defense system that needs to be deployed there. Um, and we need forward deployed uh, submarines there as well to make sure that the Beijing understands that any forced entry amphibious assault would be a very expensive item. More to the point, and I'm really interested in Gordon's take on this, is to reinforce in Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean. Uh, Beijing depends on Middle Eastern oil for almost 100% of its energy needs and all of its trade with Africa and Europe. And Beijing does not have the ability to project naval power to really protect those sea lanes over tens of thousands of miles of ocean. And were those, uh, those trade routes to be threatened, that would basically, that would be uh, catastrophic for the Chinese economy. So I think that is the weak underbelly of China and they need to be reminded of that as well. Gordon, do you have any doubt that China, it's just a matter of time before they try to take control of Taiwan? Well, they're trying to take control, but they're not successful. And they're not successful for a number of reasons, because they're threatening moves, like going into Taiwan's air defense identification zone. has just stiffened the back of people in Taiwan. People in Taiwan don't think they're Chinese, by and large. We see this from the self-identification surveys, where it shows anywhere between two-thirds to about 83 percent, 83 percent being the most recent survey, saying, no, they are Taiwanese only. And so this is important. Um, but they do need the help of the United States for reasons that John has just talked about. So that's why I think that we need a public declaration. Gordon Chang and John Jordan, or as we like to call you around here, Gordon and Jordan, it's great to have you both again with us. Thanks for the time. <laughs> Thank <laughs> Thanks, you. Thanks, Joe. Take a look at this. The feds thought the person in this picture seen at a Dodgers baseball game was a fugitive wanted for nearly a quarter of a century. But this game was five years ago. And in the end, turned out it wasn't their guy. How far gone is he if the authorities are looking at clues that old and striking out. We're on that next. And the search for Brian Laundry. Could his dad's involvement lead investigators to him? We'll find out what they say next. A breakthrough in the more than 20 year long manhunt for one of America's most wanted, or at least the U.S. Marshals thought they might have a clue. John Ruffo, now 66 years old, convicted of a $350 million bank fraud scheme back in 1998, and then he disappeared. 
Well, this week, 23 years later, the U.S. Marshals Service thought they might have spotted him in a picture from a Dodgers game. Not the one from last night, but from five years ago. Here's the picture in question. Not exactly HD, but you can see who's been highlighted there. The man in the photo has now come forward, and the results are in. He is definitely not John Ruffo, which means 23 years into the case, the best lead marshals have is a photo of a guy trying to enjoy the ball game and have a hot dog from five years ago. Let's bring in Bobby Chacon, retired FBI agent and instructor. Bobby, it's good to see you again. I guess my first question is, how in the world is somebody just going through a Dodgers game from five years ago? Yeah, you know, this is one of those leads you get on cases like this that, <clears throat> you know, no star gets on overturned and, uh, you know, you have to kind of uh, follow it out. But this was something where I believe his, <clears throat> excuse me, his cousin in New Hampshire was watching the game. It must have been a nationally televised game and, and saw this guy and literally froze the, the screen and, and sent the picture to the marshals because um, the cousin of this fugitive actually thought it resembled his cousin mm. close enough. Wow. Um, and, and that started the lead. That was, but that was five years ago, and it right. took them that long to track down who was sitting in that particular seat on that particular night. How far ahead of authorities do you think he is? Oh, he, he got, you know, he's, he's, he's years ahead, obviously. He's, yeah. he's been on the run for, what, 20, <laughs> right. over 20 plus years. He's probably overseas. He got away with, you know, estimates anywhere from $8 million to $13 million of the $350 million that he embezzled or that he, you know, was, was subject to that fraud. So he's got millions of dollars um, to, to, to stay on the run, right. and, and that money goes much further overseas. Uh, Ruffo's attorney was on Dan Abrams yesterday, and he said the guy didn't even look like him. Let's listen. Doesn't look like him. He was a much, he was a, uh, he, he, had, he was much smaller in stature. I mean, unless he's been working out at the gym every day since he left in 1998, that's not him. Am I surprised that this guy's been on the run for all these years and he has an attorney? What, is, he, is he on retainer or is he still paying him or what, Bobby? Yeah, it's hard to know, right? But he did have an attorney and he pled guilty to like 160 counts of fraud, mm -hmm. you know, way back when in the, in the 1990s. So he did have an attorney representing him. So, you know, if this attorney is looking to, you know, get back, you know, get back some publicity from the case, you know, he, he'll, he'll reappear, you know, on things like this when, when it happens. You know, I don't know if he's still getting paid by, it, by the fugitive, right. Ruffo, if he's over, overseas or what. But, you know, look, look you're looking for short you know, balding man. I mean, you're looking for George Costanza, in fact, and, <laughs> and he could be yeah, anywhere. He it's could. going to be hard to find him. So he was last seen, Bobby, at JFK. I'm wondering if this would have happened today. Do you think a judge would have let him go like he did and told him to show up at court at a certain day? You know, I mean, you wonder now. And then he goes to JFK and presumably flies out of the country. Is this something that could have happened with the Brian Laundry case? Well, I don't think it would happen, you know, in something like a murder case. I think that because I think white collar criminals are still a lot of judges still consider them nonviolent offenders and they let themselves turn themselves in. So he was literally on his way to turn himself into jail for like a 17 year sentence or something. You know, when someone's sentenced to jail for that long, I don't believe in self surrender because he's not mm. going to go to a halfway house or something. He's going away for a long right. time and, and people rethink their, their desire to spend that much time in jail. So I think that. When he was when he pled guilty, he should have been stayed in custody and, and, and brought right to jail. Then instead, they let him out pending, you know, the processing and to turn himself in at the jail, which on a, on a lengthy sentence like that, you know, yeah. I don't think it's very advisable for a judge to do that. Ten seconds left, Bobby. Do they find this guy? You know, the marshals are the best in the world at this. If anybody can do it, it's the U.S. Marshals. All right, Bobby Chacon, it's always great to have you. Thanks for your time. Good to see you. Thanks. Thank you. I want to turn now to another man on the run. We just mentioned Brian Laundry. Joining me now, News Nation's Brian Etten, for more on the ongoing search. And there are some new developments, including Laundry's father joining the search today, Brian. Yeah, today was another interesting day, Joe. You know, the Laundries haven't left their house in days, but this morning, uh, the father, Christopher Laundry, he was up bright and early. He got in his red truck and he went out to the Carlton Reserve, which is the swamp uh, that's just about 10 minutes from here. He met up with law enforcement. We watched as he got out of his truck. Uh, he was put onto sort of an all terrain vehicle known as a, a gator, um, and they took him out into the swamp. There was a helicopter up, so we kind of got a chance to see what was going on. Uh, he ended up getting off of the vehicle and then walked 
walking through the swamp. According to the attorney, he was helping police look for his son. He was out there for about three hours. Uh, the search turned up nothing like it has in past days. Uh, and then he came back here to the house. Joe? Brian, there was some talk about whether the FBI wanted his help. Uh, and I guess in the end, what I heard was that there was some thought that perhaps his father might be able to take them to some areas that they used to go together. Is that how this all went down? Exactly. So Northport police aren't telling us exactly how this went down. And FBI obviously isn't commenting at all on the investigation. But we are getting information from the laundry attorney, Mr. Bertolino. And he said just that, that the police wanted uh, Christopher Laundry out there because he knew the parts of the reserve that Brian Laundry frequented, where they would hike as a family. And they wanted him to show them uh, those areas where they thought Brian might be. All right, Brian Etten, live for us tonight, as he has been many nights in Northport, Florida. Brian, thanks for the update. We appreciate it. Thanks, Joe. Up next, a long overdue honor for a group of veterans. It's our American Snapshot, and it's coming up next. Group of service women getting a long overdue thank you for their service. That's our American Snapshot tonight. Operation Her Story, or Her Story, and Honor Flight Chicago took 93 female veterans on a trip to the nation's capital to honor their service. They are World War II, Korea, and Vietnam veterans. According to Honor Flight Chicago, fewer than 3% have flown to Washington, D.C. before this group was escorted by current female service members and also got to tour monuments. Program described as an initiative dedicated to highlighting the vital contributions of women veterans. We salute them all. That's a great picture and it is our American Snapshot tonight. That is our time. Thanks for joining us. Have a great evening. On Balance with Leland Vitter coming up next.